Uh, this, this was actually a uh, last minute change. Uh, instead of having a recorded case, I'm going to present five cases of a varying degree for massive and submassive PE. Not a problem. No, he's asked, okay, Robert, thank you. So these are my disclosures. Uh, and so th this is just our approach for some of the cases that we had. Uh, first case is a 66-year-old uh, patient uh, who possessed a sudden shortness of breath, previously ambulatory at home, uh, unable to walk uh, for a few feet, uh, becoming progressively uh, shorter breath. The CT scan showed a large saddle embolism, uh, and a patient was obviously hypoxic, hypotensive, and uh, was taken to cath lab after being intubated in the ER. This is the echocardiogram uh, at baseline. Apparently, the patient had an echo at our institute uh, before it shows an RV on the very top uh, functioning properly, and, and then below you see a, an echocardiogram in the ER showing a blown out uh, right ventricle, and the other images showed uh, McCulley's sign that you see commonly in, in massive, uh, the, uh, in submassive PE. The angiogram uh, to the left uh, shows that uh, there's a large uh, thrombus in the right upper as well as low, uh, uh, left lower, and uh, you can't see the center embolism in, a, um, in that type of magnification, but there's a shadow of it on the angiogram, and the static image is a lot more evident. If you look over to the far right screen at the top, you see a large clot burden in the, in the um, left lobe with, the, with uh, obstruction in the entire uh, left upper lobe. And in the very bottom, you see the static, the static image of the statal embolism extending bilaterally. Uh, so at the time, uh, the thought process was uh, to go ahead and start a catheter thrombolysis, and uh, we placed a bilateral uh, ECOS catheter uh, over all three five wires selectively uh, into the clot. And it's important to note that you can use regular catheters. It doesn't have to be ECOS catheter, but in this particular case, the decision was made to actually use the ultrasound capability by placing an ultrasound over and into the thrombus, and that way we have uh, the, the uh, option of using less lytics. Uh, Post-procedure, uh, uh, you can see that angiogram that there is uh, a good perfusion throughout the entire lung field. Um, and once again, you typically don't see results immediately afterwards uh, with clear or perfusion. Um, and uh, so subsequently, we uh, uh, noticed also there's a tremendous amount of clot burden, uh, DV, large DVTs that we thought was at risk. Uh, of thromboembolism, so we placed an IVC filter temporarily with intentions to actually retrieve it. And so this is a side-by-side -side image of the first case showing uh, the clot um, uh, burden prior to the procedure, and then there's a, uh, on the right side uh, an angiogram afterwards showing good perfusion. Uh, and, and you can see that the patient's intubated in both cases. And these are just static images showing a before and after, showing the saddle embolism. Uh, as well the angiogram uh, showing uh, a decrease in clot burden. Uh, so the patient ended up receiving a total of 18 milligrams of TPA uh, via the ultrasound directed thrombolysis uh, with the standard IV heparin dose. Uh, patient was discharged on a NOAC for three to six months with obvious follow-up with hemato hematology consultation to, find, to assess if it's provoked or unprovoked. The I a patient returned for electively to retrieve the filter uh, two weeks later and, and the echo uh, showed normalization and preservation of the right ventricle uh, post-procedure. Our second case is a 67-year-old patient who uh, has uh, multiple mor morbidities who also presented with sudden onset of shortness of breath. Uh, she noticed uh, prior to all her symptoms that one of her legs was swollen. Uh, there was a high suspicion of pulmonary embolism by our ER department who uh, uh, after getting an echocardiogram, decided to bypass the CAT scan and direct, send it directly to the cath lab. And in our pr program at the Detroit Medical Center, we allow that uh, flow. So, for example, if the emergency room uh, physician has a high suspicion of pulmonary embolism and, they, and our ER physicians are capable of doing echoes and are actually really good at doing echoes, uh, based on that suspicion, uh, they'll send the patient directly to the cath lab. Um, and this is an, an echocardiogram that was done in the ER showing a blown out right ventricle with McCulley's sign, a clearly dilated right ventricle. It's greater than one, it was like 1.5. And in the cross sectional view, you see a D shaped um, um, high pressure right ventricle and the septal bouncing. So a selective uh, angiogram showed uh, extensive clot burden uh, selectively in the uh, left uh, lower field, also uh, extending peripherally. And so in this uh, case, we selectively placed an ECOS, but it's very important uh, to note that the ECOS extended all the way through and in the thrombus uh, so we could limit our lytic dose. And this, uh, after removal of the ECOS, this is just a side-by-side -side comparison of pre and post. 
Um, the third case uh, is a 65-year-old patient that came in after having a three-week three surgical uh, procedure, cranial surgery, was in respiratory distress. Um, the uh, RV-LV ratio is greater than 1.5. Patient continued to be hypertensive despite uh, two to three pressors. Hemoglobin was low and had elevated uh, uh, cardiobiomarkers. And so we had some uh, challenges here because of the, of the uh, usage of either thrombolytics or IV heparin. And so the uh, CT scan showed a very large uh, thrombus, uh, throbbing burden, and uh, despite um, the conservative therapy, uh, the patient's uh, pressors uh, could, not, uh, could not be weaned off. And uh, there was some struggle with uh, the other specialists and what type of uh, lytics and how much and could they, and we really couldn't get a consensus of what type of lytics and if we could use any other type of lytics. So we decided uh, to go in and to mechanically extract the thrombus um, and this was, uh, as uh, shown in previous talk by Dr. Kaki, this is a, um, our uh, Anjuvac. Um, in my talk, actually, I mentioned that. And this is go it goes around, and we were able to get some suction of the clot burden, uh, retrieve it, uh, with very little heparin used. And uh, afterwards, an angiogram uh, showing, after the procedure, showing that the most of the clot burden had resolved. We weren't able to do a CAT scan afterwards. And so that uh, patient dynamically ended up uh, improving, uh, coming off the pressors, and then uh, uh, subsequently after it was cleared by uh, neurosurgery and surgery, the uh, patient was placed on a NOAC safely in the hospital. Um, the fourth case is a 60-year-old uh, patient with DVT uh, off the hand to, uh, anticoagulation, presented with respiratory distress and swelling in the ER. The CT scan showed a, a massive PE, and the PESI score was, was uh, very high in the echo signs, um, showed Macaulay's sign with a blown out RV uh, with ex extreme uh, hypotension that was recorded. Uh, echocardiogram shows that the RV is dilated, um, and there's a static image next to it. And there's a, a, once again a large saddle embolism extending uh, both to the right and left lung, and angiogram shows uh, even a bifurcation of the saddle embolism to the right upper and lower. So, Patient had uh, elevated uh, PA pressures, a right ventricle had a PAPI score of less than one, so like uh, 0 0.9. Uh, so bilateral ECOS was placed uh, for six hours, totaling a total of TPA, uh, tw 20 milligrams of TPA, and uh, a patient was brought back and it showed clot resolution. Um, uh, uh, and the size of the clot burden actually was decreased. However, the right ventricle still uh, did not recover. The patient continued to be hypotensive like uh, four uh, days uh, after the intervention and uh, despite IV pressors. So we, uh, we decided to do uh, some right ventricular uh, circulatory support with the RP impella. And as uh, Dr. Kaki alluded earlier, the indication for RP impella circulatory support in patients uh, that have acute right heart failure or in some of the cases uh, presented earlier in patients that uh, have uh, uh, myocardial infarction or, or for transplant or open surgery that continue to decompensate uh, with left ventricular assist uh, uh, device. So the, the, the pump is very simple. There's an inflow um, motor that uh, blood goes into the inflow and then out into the pulmonary artery. Uh, it's uh, very uniquely shaped and also presents with a challenge because it's, it's three, so it's not only is it curved, but it's curved anterior and posterior in, in a way to design to enter the right ventricle. And the challenge when taking this device is, is, is uh, coming out of the sheath and the second part would be uh, as you cross into, it's either going to be clock or counterclock, uh, depending on the curvature of the device. And I'll show you an, uh, an angiogram of that. So this is a, uh, the sheath uh, entering into the uh, venous system. It's a very large bore sheath, but once again, we're dealing with the venous system, not uh, like the arterial, so you have some flexibility. And here's the device coming out, out of the sheath and entering uh, um, the, the uh, right, right atrium. And this is the placement of the impella. Uh, we use a... Um, uh, wired placed in the left pulmonary artery uh, to anchor, and then we pull that out, and it is a, almost like a pigtail-like at the end of the device. And if we take the device and we do a panoramic view, you can see how the device uh, faces, goes anterior, then, then up and over into uh, the pulmonary artery. Let me just go back and play that again. Okay. Okay, so I can't play it again, huh? Okay. Uh, anyways, patient uh, received uh, oral thrombo, uh, uh, no acts, IV fluids, RP impella was placed for about two days, uh, and subsequently were able to take the patients off the pressors, 
maintain the blood pressure. Uh, there's a recovery. Uh, Post-procedure, uh, I think three to four days, uh, showed a uh, PAPI score that's improved. A patient was discharged. Um, and then three-month follow-up showed that uh, there was a recovery of the right ventricle. Uh, and so some of the studies that we've shown, a decrease in uh, PA pressure, very similar to Dr. Kaki's uh, in, in, uh, presentation, uh, because it, uh, and we showed a decrease in uh, right atrial pressure as well immediately afterwards. So the R RV Impella, RP Impella, is reliable uh, and safe if done in very select cases. It shows hemodynamic um, support, uh, but you know, it's, there's some um, um, more data that's needed in it. So some of the management of acute uh, RV failure is, uh, as we mentioned earlier in Dr. Kaki's talk, is that we can't really rely on a PAPI score. It's just not, um, it's not as reliable, especially with Impella, all bets are off because of the, the, the uh, flow disturbance uh, from the Impella itself, the Impella motor. Uh, but some of uh, the possible expansion uh, uh, that we could use some of this uh, for our RP Impella support is using uh, a number of things, using a CT scan or echo looking at the RV-LV ratio, uh, McCulley sign, but we're mainly looking at pressures and, and uh, 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 sinus tachycardia is another indicator that's not on this list that's very important in determining if, if patient needs a right ventricular systolic support. And the last case I want to discuss is this uh, 80 two-year-old lady who came in uh, with multiple comorbidities, uh, subsequently uh, had uh, surgery uh, four weeks prior to admission, uh, and she presented differently. She presented with a left arm uh, pain uh, and some shortness of breath simultaneously. So she was tachycardic, tachypneic, hypoxic, uh, but she was mainly complaining of this painful, pulseless, cold left hand and upper extremity. Uh, her blood pressures were stable, uh, but she was tachycardic, hypoxic, and had some respiratory distress. And uh, so she was rushed over um, after uh, seeing that her arm was cold for uh, uh, evaluation. And so we, she was sent over for pulmonary and left extremity uh, angiogram. The echocardiogram at base uh, at, uh, um, uh, showed an RV blown out, as you've seen earlier, but it was also noted the patient had a, a DVT, as you can see on the left side, left side of the screen. And so an angiogram was done selectively, and this is the catheter in the left subclavian artery with no flow going down to the, the, the brachial and low extremities, and there's a cutoff. And as you can see, there's a sheath that was placed distally in the far right screen, showed complete occlusion, uh, uh, thrombosis of the, with very little flow um, trickling down her left arm. She was also noted to have a massive, uh, or actually submassive PE, and uh, subsequently it was decided that we were going to uh, address both the issues simultaneously. Her arm was at risk, it was cold. Uh, she was starting to lose somewhat movement of her, of her arm uh, and a, a extreme rest pain uh, took place. So uh, we placed uh, immediately a, a ECOS catheter into her uh, left uh, uh, brachial extending down to her um, uh, left extremity as well as uh, noticing that there's a uh, large clot uh, which we, uh, we dealt with. So this is, uh, uh, if you look over to the far left screen, you can see that there is a ECOS catheter that's placed uh, into the left, uh, into the trunk via the left uh, uh, pulmonary artery, and there's also an ECOS catheter extending to the left arm uh, simultaneously. Um, and so uh, the patient had left, uh, left upper extremity uh, uh, pulses resolved. She had pulses, uh, and so, uh, she uh, developed bleeding complication in the right groin. It was hypertensive. Uh, it had to be treated, but we, we end up uh, um, resolving that. Um, she was brought back down for 12 hours and removed both ECOs. We had to use a covered stent for one of her groin complication. And um, angiogram of the lower extremity was done. It showed that uh, there was a resolution of, of the clot. There was still a little bit of a clot residual left over, so uh, this is a penumbra that we used to uh, suction and aspirate majority of the, of the clot that was kind of localized right by her brachial area. And you can see as a, a post-procedure on the far right that there's a brisk flow distally with some uh, very small amount of uh, thrombus distally. This is a clot that was extracted. And so um, the patient's arm was warm, uh, good pulses distally, uh, patient's tachycardia and um, a tachypnea resolved. Uh, we thought that it was not really a hypercoagulostate given her age of onset, 
and we thought that uh, the etiology was probably most relate, related to her immobilization from her surgery. And um, echo was done to look for a cardioembolic source because we couldn't explain why uh, she would have both uh, arterial and uh, venous uh, thromboembolism. And so a TE was done, and we found that the patient had a, uh, a PFO with possible um, a large PFO with crossover. You can see, I think it was, uh, yeah, you can see a color image going through it. So we decided, uh, and so we went back and looked at the angiogram, and we noticed that her right, her left uh, subclavian artery had an angle of it. It's not typically that you would see, and we felt that, that, that this was the source of embolism, that she most likely developed a DVT, uh, crossed into uh, causing a, a PE, but subsequently broke off into uh, um, uh, the right atrium and crossed over to the left side, and the angulation of her aortic arch, which I don't have a picture of, was a direct uh, uh, in the same line of the left subclavian artery. And so uh, uh, we brought her back to fix her and put a septal closure. And so the thought process is she had a DVT, as we mentioned, a pulmonary embolism crossed into the her ASD. So you can see it wobbling and then her left atrial occlusion. So in some of these cases, you know, massive and submassive, they're going to, uh, once again, as we mentioned in my talk, it's underdiagnosed, undertreated, high mortality. We still need evidence. Every, every patient, as you saw in, in the last five cases, really need to be tailored. And uh, you really need a PERT program that's multidisciplinary that involves all specialties. Uh, which includes, you know, uh, vascular surgery, interventional radiology, uh, ER, ICU, uh, for it to be really collaborative and effective. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you.